you could also call this, instead of from landscape to wildscape, you could call it the what, why, and how of gardening for wildlife, because that's how I'm gonna divide this up. I'm gonna talk about what a wildscape is, why we need to wildscape in urban areas, in particular in our home gardens, and then uh, how, how we actually do that in just a few short tips. So let's talk first about what a wildscape is. So unsurprisingly, a wildscape or wildlife habitat is any garden, the primary purpose of which is to support wildlife. So what does that actually translate to? It means that every choice that I make, either in plant choice or garden design or maintenance of my garden, all of those are geared primarily to supporting wildlife. You have to think of a wildscape as a community of plants and wildlife. You know, in the wild, an ecosystem is composed of plants and the animals that use them. And so we have to think of it as an organism um, that is meant to promote wildlife. So in suburban areas, it's important to say that this is not ecological restoration, which like the Katy Prairie Conservancy west of Houston is an awesome thing. And that one is trying literally to recreate what was there before human intervention. That's not what we have in urban areas because just in one sense, I would love to have the Katy Prairie in my front yard, but my neighbors would probably revolt. So it's in the words of Rainier and West, whose book I'll show you later, it's, they term it a designed plant community and they consider it a hybrid of horticulture and ecology. And so what it does is it takes cues from nature in our area. So hill country more for y'all, uh, Gulf Coast Prairie for me, and interprets it into something that will read garden to passersby. Because if our neighbors cannot recognize it as a garden, if it doesn't look intentional, then they won't embrace it. So ultimately it's about the two C's, critters and community. And here's the good news y'all that you can be 100% supportive of wildlife and yet make it look intentional. Does that make sense? So instead of just telling you what it is, I thought I would show you some examples. So this is um, a friend of mine, Jerry Hamby. He and his wife have property down in Clear Lake. And this is their interpretation of that um, hybrid of horticulture and ecology, a wildscape. So what you notice here is that there are intentional beds and within the beds, it looks pretty wild. It kind of looks like what we'd have here on the prairie, except very heavy on forbs. That said, notice the intelligent use, the clever use of thick, chunky borders to make it look intentional. And that's really a good design rule of thumb, by the way, if you want to have a more um, natural looking interior to your garden bed, then make the surrounding of it look really intentional and bigger. This is from Jaime Gonzalez, who was with the Katy Prairie Conservancy and now with the Nature Conservancy here in Houston. I aspire to be Jaime when I grow up. He's a fantastic educator and knows all of the things. So this is their little home in Houston. You can see on the left-hand side, this is their backyard that instead of material for the borders of his beds, he just has a sharp delineation between the garden bed with all native plants and the lawn in between. So again, it translates what's out there in our local prairie and makes it look intentional. Now this one I adore, my friend Patty. This is in the heart of the Montrose area. This is the wildest example I'm gonna show you. Um, she doesn't have deed restrictions or an HOA that would prevent this. I think it's absolutely beautiful. And what you can see is that there's actually paths and an arbor through here. But this is just another way. And finally, these are my home gardens here in Houston. This is spring of 2020. And again, you can see that inside the beds, there are some techniques to make it look intentional, but it also looks a little wilder. So notice the paths and the chunky uh, moss stone garden beds on the edges. And here also is another view. So this is what I want you to take away from these examples, y'all. I think in our mind, it's either wild or traditional. It's not true. It's a spectrum. On the one end is very manicured and traditional without native plants. On the other is the Katy Prairie, which is awesome. And all points in between, depending on your taste and your neighborhood vibe, those are acceptable, okay?
So now that we've talked a little bit about what a wildscape is on a global level, I thought it would be helpful to talk about what pollinates in a wildscape. So pollinators are not uniquely insects, but in large part they are, and it's a subset of all insects and invertebrates. So let me introduce you to a few. So basically, a pollinator is any animal, insect or not, that takes the pollen from the male component of a flower and deposits it into the female component so that seed or berries can be produced. That's, that's all it is to produce seed and to propagate the species. So of course, bees, we all know are excellent pollinators. So I'm gonna give you just a few fun facts. And by the way, this is a, a participatory class and those who don't participate have to stay after to clean the erasers. Y'all ready? Okay, take your pinky finger and hold it up. And I want you to look at the flesh colored center of your fingernail, right? Not the white tip. That is the size of that center flower right here with the little black bee. Does anyone know what that is? What flower is that? Texas. You're on mute. Oh, I'm sorry, anyone. <laughs> I keep forgetting. It's Texas frog fruit, Phyllanota flora. So as small as that flower head is, that flower head is the size of the flesh color in your fingernail on your pinky finger, that bee is smaller. And by the way, that's not our smallest bee in North America. So this bee is only a few millimeters big. In contrast, hold up your thumb. From the knuckle, the last knuckle to the tip of the thumb is about the size of some of our carpenter bees and bumbles. So here in the middle right, that's um, a Strands carpenter bee male. Isn't he gorgeous? So, they range in size from a few millimeters to about an inch, and they all feed with a tongue, some longer and some shorter. And on an evolutionary scale, they've, they've evolved to be very fuzzy because they are, um, uh, Dr. Jaw at UT calls them uh, vegetarian wasps. They're descended from wasps, and uh, their larvae consume pollen. They do not consume other insects. And so they've developed those sort of brushy furs the females have to collect pollen. There are around 4,000 species of bee that are native to North America, and the honeybee is not one of them. And in Texas, we have about 1,100. But we also know that butterflies pollinate. Now, butterflies are interesting because the, way, the thing primarily with which they pollinate is the proboscis, which we can think of as a tongue, but it's not quite. And whereas we all think of the proboscis as a straw, it's actually more like a sponge. It absorbs liquid through capillary action. And so, to be honest with you, some of the bigger butterflies are not as skilled pollinators as are bees because their legs are long, the proboscis is long and narrow, and so their little bodies are not right up in the pollen. At St. Julian's Crossing last month, I recorded our 51st species of butterfly. Pretty amazing for a modest-sized garden in the heart of Houston. Moths are also like butterflies in the order Lepidoptera, which translates to scale wing. And here's a fun fact about butterflies and moths. They actually don't have fur or hair. What looks like hair on a butterfly and moth is actually a modified specialized scale, and thus the name Lepidoptera, scale wing. Like butterflies, moths also feed with a proboscis. So again, it unfurls, um, but their bodies, it depends on the moth, can be a little bit fuzzier and can uh, also pick up pollen pretty well. Now this I didn't realize when I started this adventure five years ago. Flies are actually pretty darn good pollinators as well. They don't tend to be fuzzy like bees, but they tend to be low to the ground and small. And they actually have, instead of a tongue or a proboscis, they have a little spongy, shallow, flat mouth part that kind of comes out. So they have to get very much into the nectar reward in order to feed. And most of them feed on um, pollen, and, on nectar and a little bit on pollen. What's really cool about some flies, like on the bottom, the one on the left and the one in the middle that I'm circling now, is that these are in the family called hover flies or surfed flies. Not all of them, but many of them have larvae that are predaceous. And so a single larva of a hoverfly, depending on the species, can eat two to 400 aphids before it pupates. So it's extra bang for the buck. And look how darn pretty they are. Now I am one with wasps in my home garden. 
a lot of people are like, ah, they're a little scary, they can sting. So here's the thing about wasps. Wasp, um, again, most of the adults feed on nectar or maybe some pollen. And therefore, even though they're not as good at pollinating as bees because they tend to have less hair, they nonetheless are pollinators because they get in there with their tongue like bees and they feed on the nectar and um, thereby transfer the pollen to the male part of the flower. Uh, wasps actually are a huge component in biocontrol, natural biocontrol um, in a garden. So I haven't used pesticides of any kind at St. Julian's for almost five years now. And wasps are fantastic because baby wasps eat other insects. And so the mama wasp will collect them and keep those little garden pests, white flies, mealybugs, aphids, all kinds of stuff out of your garden. And I like to say when I'm teaching the four Bs, beetles, bugs, bats, and hummingbirds. <laughs> so basically any animal that takes pollen from the male component to the female while it feeds. And so those are our pollinators. So that's the what of wildscaping. I thought we'd talk for a little bit about why we need wildscapes. I'm gonna focus more broadly on all insects, although sometimes I'll talk about pollinators as a subset. This is a fantastic study that's 14 years old now. So the authors of this study wanted to figure out uh, which native insect, insects, so how much, how, let me rephrase it, what the value of the eco services that our native insects bring to us, what that dollar value might be each year in the United States. And they excluded honeybees because there's a lot of data on honeybees and besides honeybees are not native. So when they did this study, their estimate, which they admitted was low, is that insects bring us eco services of at least around $60 billion a year. And they knew that that was low. So let's talk about those services that insects bring us. So of course, pollination. Again, they're not the only pollinators, but they are particularly good pollinators and there are lots of them. So about two thirds of our crops need pollination in order to fruit or to produce what we need for food. And that translates to about a third of what's on our plate each day. So this is in the order of billions of dollars a year. Likewise, more broadly than crops, insects um, are in very important pollinators for plants generally. So depending on the study that you look at, between 75 to 95% of our flowering plants need animals to pollinate them. The others are wind pollinated or other forms. Uh, but again, the insects do the heavy lifting on this. And of course we need plants for many reasons, not just for our crops, but the more plants we have, the more control of erosion we have, the deeper the root of the plant, the more carbon and the more water they can sequester. In Houston, we're very concerned about flooding. So we want to make sure that there are future generations of flowering plants and therefore we need insects to provide that service. Third, food chain. So the frog and the, uh, get, uh, the uh, chameleon are here to remind us that some higher level in, uh, animals directly eat insects. So insects are really good at converting plant matter to proteins and other nutrients that other animals need, whether it be birds or mammals or amphibians or reptiles. So if we don't have enough insects, then those higher orders, if you will, in that predatory uh, scale of animals will start to have problems. The squirrel is there to remind us that many animals, birds, mammals, etc., cetera, uh, either eat entirely or supplement their diet with berries, nuts, fruits. And those berries, nuts, and fruits that need animal services to, um, to, to be created, in other words, pollination services, if we don't have enough insect pollinators, then we don't have enough food for those animals that rely on the fruits of those plants. And the bird is there because, um, I just wanna spend a minute on that. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Doug Tallamy, He's an entomologist who's written a couple of books I'm gonna introduce you to later. 
He's an entomologist who doesn't write or speak like an entomologist. Really engaging and really impassioned. And so part of his studies, uh, when he was looking at um, ecosystems and insect services for them, is that he decided to see, like he knew that, um, that birds eat insects. So about a quarter of adult birds' diets consist of insects, about a quarter. But that is not true for their chicks. For terrestrial birds, about 96% of the species, their chicks can eat only insects and other arthropods. The chicks cannot digest berries, nuts, or seeds. Okay, so Dr. Tallamy set out, either in his own study or another study that he was relating in his books, to find out just how many insects a mama bird has to have for her baby chicks. So he studied um, the Carolina chickadees, I think in the Northeast. And what they discovered was shocking. A single mama chickadee for a single clutch needs not dozens, not hundreds, but thousands of insects to feed a single clutch, thousands. So if we don't have insects, the baby birds die and the food chain collapses. <laughs> We also rely on insects for decomposition services. So they convert dung, even carrion. They break down plant matter. Um, they also, when they die, they release nitrogen and other nutrients from their body into the soil. So we rely on them for those services. And finally, we rely on them for pest control, about four and a half billion dollars annually. Um, either through predators that eat other insects or parasitoids where the females lay the egg inside another insect and it eats it from the inside out when it hatches. Nature is a bit brutal. So um, in our gardens, one of the reasons that we haven't had to use pesticides is that we have a lot of biodiversity. And to paraphrase Dr. Doug Tallamy, if you have an insect pest problem, you need more insects because insects take care of their own. The problem is that insects are in trouble. We don't know the full parameters yet because entomologists are still doing studies to determine the overall loss in numbers and species and biomass. But the preliminary data is extremely bad. And we could spend a week talking about the drivers of insect decline. You see them here on the screen but they're being hit from all sides. And again, we don't know exactly how all these interact yet, but we know that they contribute in some way or suspect it. That first bullet point, habitat loss, fragmentation, and degradation, a lot of that is brought on by humans. You know, my area of Texas was a coastal prairie, and now it's cities. <laughs> and Houston now meets Katy, now meets the woodlands. So there's not a lot of unbroken land for them to use. And the more it's fragmented, the harder it is on them. So this is problematic. Um, again, as you can see on this screen, there's a serious decline in insects abundance, biodiversity, and biomass worldwide. And I'm just going to give you a little taste of a couple of studies and then move on because again, we don't have a lot of time on this. So in Germany, there was a study that was published in 2017. It was a 27 year study of flying insects only, um, where they were caught over 27 years at 63 nature preserves that didn't reduce in size. So these are nature preserves and not neighborhoods or urban areas otherwise. The results showed that there was a 76% decline in the overall mass of insects in that almost 30 year period in nature preserves. And likewise, between 1976, when data was recorded, and 2012, when it was recorded again in one of Puerto Rico's rainforests, the authors found a, a decline of 30 to 60 times, not percent, times in the number of insects captured in ground traps in that rainforest and parallel decreases in insectivorous birds, lizards, and frogs. And finally, in June of 2019, uh, Mangame News published a four-part series, which is mentioned in that uh, 
the, one of the handouts I gave you. And they asked 24 entomologists from six continents and happened to be representing 12 countries on a scale of zero to 10, with zero being no problem and 10 being dire. How would you rate the problem, the crisis of overall loss of insect uh, numbers, diversity, and so forth? No one rated it below eight, and some relate, rated it as a 10. So this is a problem because we just saw all those eco services that they bring us. Um, someone said one time, um, insects can live without us, but we cannot live without insects. And so entomologists themselves are calling for action now, even though the data collection is ongoing at all levels, y'all, international, national, state, local, and us, individual. So I don't know about you, but after that Debbie Downer moment, <laughs> I could sure use some rejoice and be glad news. Are you ready for the rejoice and be glad moment? Here we go. Right here, right now, right in our own gardens, we are a critical link in the chain that will save insects and thus our ecosystem. Right here, right now, right at home. And I'm not gonna lie to you, if all that we do is change our home gardening to be insect supportive, that is not gonna be enough because remember, it has to be at all levels. But here's the beautiful thing about a chain. Chains cannot function without all of the links. Whoops, sorry. They can't function without all of the links. Wow, I went ahead, didn't I? And we are a critical link. I don't know about you, but that empowers me. Like knowing that all I have to do is change what I, I do at home, that I am that link in that chain that can save insects, that and a cup of coffee gets me going in the morning. And this is what Dr. Talamy says about it in Bringing Nature Home. Now, for the first time in history, gardening has taken on a role that transcends the needs of the garden. Like it or not, gardeners have become important players in the management of our nation's wildlife. It is now within the power of individual gardeners to do something that we all dream of doing, to make a difference. That's awesome. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. Are you with me? It's weird talking into a screen, y'all. Let me tell you, right? <laughs> all right. When we convert part or all of our home gardens to a wildscape, using some of the techniques I'm gonna tell you about in a minute. We create what the researchers call stepping stones, or in the words of Doug Tallamy, biological corridors that help the insects survive by giving them places to go for shelter, food, um, and mating. So a little teeny little bee on that Texas frog fruit, remember, cannot get from my house in Northwest Houston all the way down to the center of Houston to Memorial Park, but by gum, it can get from my house to my next door neighbor's Gallardia Pulcella. And it can get from there, two houses down to my next neighbor's. You with me? So we are in charge of creating stepping stones. And Dr. Tallamy, in his latest book, Nature's Best Hope, I'll show you a screenshot in a minute, calls this homegrown national park. Isn't that cool? We are a national park, in his words, within an urban area. So. If I could recommend only two books on the, the why of wildscaping, not the how, these by Dr. Doug Tallamy are the ones I would recommend. The one on the left, Bringing Nature Home, is maybe 10 or so years old. It was his original. And Nature's Best Hope is his follow-up that was published in February of this year. They read fast. It, I was doing this like three years already when I read Bringing Nature Home, and it, it changed my worldview. That's how impactful they are. So you wanna know how to do it? Let's get into the how. Okay, before we get into the how, I thought it would be useful to give you three recommendations on wildscaping books that I adore. 
Uh, the first is called The Living Landscape by Rick Dark, who's a landscaper using native plants, and Dr. Doug Tallamy. So that takes the why of Dr. Doug Tallamy's books and shows you some hows. If I am more of a beginning gardener, that's the book that I want because it's a little more basic. On the right-hand side, Rainier and West, I was talking about their book earlier. Uh, Planting in a Post-Wild World is also outstanding. It's more for the intermediate level gardener, although go ahead and get it if you're interested. It's a great book. Um, they are not, here's the one thing, they don't like really focus in on native plants only. They say whatever works is fine, but they do, but everything they teach you in it, all the techniques, can totally be used with 100% native species to your ecoregion. Um, and there, it's just a fantastic book. And finally, Garden Revolution, which I would say is the highest level. It is incredibly detailed. It is above my pay grade for sure, but I have it and I'm slowly getting through it. And I have gotten some ideas out of this that have transformed how I garden and made my life a lot easier. Can't recommend these enough. So let's talk about tips. First, support the home team. And what I mean by support the home team, I'm preaching to the choir here a bit, is plant plants native to your ecoregion. So uh, as you probably know, the idea of, of what a native plant is, is actually sort of a hotly debated topic. I kind of like Dr. Ptolemy's explanation. In it, you kind of consider three things. Time, in other words, it's a plant that's been there for millennia, right? Not just for a few hundred years. Place, it's been there for millennia. <laughs> so it's adapted over thousands of years, for example, to the particular um, characteristics of the soil, the water, and the rest in a particular area. And community. We, we can't really think of native plants in the abstract because they co-evolve with animals. So to me, it, and I agree with Dr. Tallamy in this, you have to think about historical evolutionary relationships between the plants that have been there over a long time and the animals that feed on them, okay? So that's what I mean by native plant. So uh, Texas is large. <laughs> and as you know, being MIPSOT members, like I am too, um, just because a plant is from Texas and native to somewhere in Texas does not mean it's appropriate for my area of Texas. And so this is straight up from the EPA. Uh, I think you're in the areas of 30A there, maybe 30B. I'm not sure what your ecoregion is called, but whatever it is, I would, um, I would in strive to incorporate into my garden those plants that have grown up with the, that have grown in areas that, um, that are like where I'm trying to establish the garden. So why do we want native plants? So the first reason is they feed more creatures. Um, about 90% of plant feeding insects, according to a study that Dr. Tallamy quotes in his books, at some point in their development are specialists on plants. And what does that mean? That means that they can digest and process the leaf or pollen or whatever of only those plants in a specific family, genus, or species. So think about monarch and queen butterflies. Their larvae feed on Asclepius, right? They feed on milkweed. So they are specialists at the larval stage, not the adult, but the larval stage on plants in the genus Asclepius. So 90% of insects are specialists. And it's not that they can't feed, and it's primarily for leaf, but also some bees for pollen. Their babies can eat only certain, the pollen of certain species or genera. So it's not that they can't necessarily eat plants that are not native to the area. So think of Eastern black swallowtails, which are native here. They can also feed on parsley and other things that are not native to North America. It's just that you get more bang from your, for your buck, and it's more likely that more things can feed on the plants with which they've evolved because they've evolved to consume those chemicals. Um, so they feed more critters. Additionally, they're hardier in our climate. 
So if I plant something from the Texas panhandle here in Houston, where we have a lot of rain in the spring, it's gonna rot. Likewise, if I have a water loving plant and I'm in the panhandle and I plant that water loving plant from the coast up in my garden, I'm gonna be spending a lot of money to water it. So, you know, in, in Houston, our plants that are native to our prairie are used to being nuked in the summer and drowned in the spring, right? So it's just, it's cheaper. You have to replace them less often and they're hardier. Um, depending on the species of plant, and in particular the depth of the root, they can also help sequester and purify water and also prevent erosion. So what you see here is from a prairie. I think it's from the central part of the U.S., maybe Blacklands or something, but not the coastal area. But you can see along the middle here, I'm going to move my cursor, that's actually the top of the soil. So some of the roots of our prairie plants can go down 14 feet, like longer below ground than a human adult is tall. The deeper the root, the more water and the more carbon it can sequester. So it's not that every plant in my coastal garden has roots this deep, but many of them do, especially some of the grasses um, even some of the forbs with deeper tap roots. So again, you want longer roots. And it's also okay if they get out. And why is it okay if they get out? Because they were there originally. So it doesn't matter if your native plant is aggressive because it was aggressive in the ecosystem before. But what you don't want is an aggressive non-native plant that nothing has evolved to eat. That's the problem. We actually use the term invasive for those. So I'm going to give you a list of some plants that the Houston Audubon Society and some others have identified as invasive. This screen shows one of the worst, which is Chinese tallow. Popcorn tree, we call it in the South, which was brought in for landscaping. And by the way, the reason these plants that no insects can eat were brought in to our urban areas is because no insects can eat them. They're pest resistant. But if they're aggressive and pest resistant because they have chemicals that can't be consumed, then they outcompete the native plants when they get out. Chinese tallow is responsible. I mean, it's highly aggressive. And birds eat the berries and they spread the seeds everywhere. This is responsible for the destruction of prairie remnants. It's, it's bad. In addition, Bradford pear. Please get Mexican plum or something else besides Bradford pear. Nandina or tree of heaven, ligustrum, elephant ear, pampas grass, Chinese privet, and Japanese honeysuckle. So it's not that we can't have plants that are not native to our ecoregion in our garden. We're about 87% species of plant in my gardens that are native because I haven't won the lottery and I don't have enough money to just yank everything out and put everything in. But what I have that's not native um, is not aggressive. So that's the difference. Second, tip two, avoid pesticides. Pretty self-explanatory. I cannot highly enough recommend this book. It's by Jessica Walliser. She's written two books on this subject at least, but this is her later one, Attracting Beneficial Bugs to Your Garden. I like this because she introduces you to the different types of predators and parasitoids, but then she also gives you garden designs so that you can compare those nectar and pollen plants that bring in the adult predators that feed on nectar, remember, that will eat the pests on your particular crop plant. Really nicely done. So the way to keep a garden pest free naturally is to welcome in these things like wasps, assassin bugs, ambush bugs, robber flies, welcome them in. And I am one with the fact that wasps consume, their, their larvae consume most of my butterfly caterpillars. I know that freaks people out, but you know what? In nature, only about one out of every 100 butterfly eggs becomes an adult. I'm okay with that. And by the way, mama birds particularly like Lepidopteran caterpillars, moth and butterfly, 
because they're high in fat and protein and they're soft. So I'll just throw that out there. <laughs> Mix it up, tip three. So why do I say that we want a variety of plants? It's because as we saw at the beginning, pollinators and insects come in all different shapes and sizes. Some have a long proboscis to feed from, others have a shallow spongy mouth part like flies. Some are big, the size of my hand for some of the larger butterfly species, some are a millimeter or two. So we need a variety of plants to take care of a variety of insects that are different sized and that feed in different ways. So first, I wanna choose flowers of different sizes and colors. Sizes you can well see because a monarch's gonna have a very hard time landing on a teeny little, you know, like partridge pea or something, but it's gonna find it easy um, on a large composite flower like a blanket flower, for example, or lance leaf coreopsis. This one was new to me, colors. So not only do insects see color differently from how humans do, which is not surprising, but they see cover, color differently between the different types of insects. So for example, bees have a kind of a hard time distinguishing red from green, but they can really easily see white, purple, and yellow. So they are particularly attractive to white, purple, and yellow flowers. Likewise, butterflies and hummingbirds are particularly attracted to reds. So do I have to memorize what colors of flowers accommodate different types of insects? No, I just have a lot of different colors and I'm gonna tick some boxes. You also want flowers with different structures. Again, remember that um, the insects that pollinate them and that depend on these flowers for food are different sizes and their mouth parts are very different. So a tubular flower is gonna be very hard for certain insects to get into, bees, for example, with shorter tongues, but really easy for a butterfly with a long proboscis to feed from. Um, of particular benefit are the composite flowers. So you see the Gallardia pulchella in the middle, the Indian blanket or firewheel. So composite flowers are great because the outside petals are just ray petals for the flower, but the inside of course is composed of sometimes of hundreds of little mini flower centers, right? So there, there are dozens and dozens of nectar rewards. So I think of this as like going to the shopping mall where you can do all your shopping in you know, the shopping mall, as opposed to having to drive from store to store to store. So I don't care what size insect you have, they're gonna get a lot of bang for the buck from composite flowers. And those are some of the most popular in my gardens. You also wanna choose uh, plants that bloom in different seasons. So in my gardens, when I select native plants, I read up on them to make sure that I have some that are blooming in fall and very early spring. Because again, you know, I, I, the worst thing is to have the buffet open really lavishly in the spring and summer and then nothing for them to eat in the fall or very early spring when they come out of um, diapause, which is their hibernation. Tip four, pile it up. Good, had to check on time there. I get excited, so sometimes I go a little bit long. Um, okay, so basically for a couple of reasons, you want to plant in clusters of species. Uh, Flo Hanna, who um, sadly passed away a few years ago, was highly involved in the Katy Prairie Conservancy. And her rule of thumb, I've always heard, was that you want to plant plants in odd numbers, threes, fives, sevens, and kind of cluster them together. And so you can see examples of that on the left and on the right, some clustering there. So there are two reasons for this. The first is aesthetic. So remember how we saw that wildscapes are on a scale of wild to traditional and anything in between, depending on your preference? The more that you cluster your plants next to each other, the more intentional and traditional your garden bed looks. You see what I'm talking about? 
if it looks intentional, it reads garden. And so on the right hand side, on that right bed, I have Rebecca Herta, so Black Eyed Susan, and Gilardia Pulcella, and um, Salvia Coccinia. And I have them in clusters. Now, over the years, they've become a little more mixed up, which I actually am starting to love a lot. But because of that, I beefed up the border, and now it's bordered in rocks. So you see on that sliding scale, you can make it more organized inside or more organized on the border. The other reason that you want to plant in clusters is um, for support of insects. There are some insects, bees in particular, that practice what we call flower constancy. Honeybees do this, which makes them very good pollinators. Flower constancy is when the insect wants to feed as much as it can on the same species of flower before moving to the next. So they might start on Gallardia pulchella and they want to eat from that as much before they move on. So if you cluster them together, again, it's like going to the shopping mall. They don't have to hunt for it. And it just looks pretty, doesn't it? When you plant in clusters. This doesn't mean that you literally have to have a patch of Indian blanket, a patch of, you know, Mexican hat, a patch of you know, uh, scarlet sage, you can combine them. And so uh, what you see in the top right is aromatic aster, which is native to your area, I think, not to mine, but I have it here. And um, Solidago sempervirens, which is um, seaside goldenrod. And on the bottom, Texas coneflower and um, bee balm, Monarda fistulosa. So I've mixed them together and you can do complementary colors or adjacent colors on the color wheel, depending on what you uh, aesthetic you want. Embrace imperfection, tip five. Okay, after a freeze, what's the first thing we want to do in our garden? <laughs> we wanna hack down all of those stems and all of those seed heads that are brown. And in fact, now as our spring and summer flowers are going to seed, like you see on the right-hand side, that's um, a Texas coneflower and um, a rough coneflower there in front, of the, the, um, in front of the goldenrod. I used to want to just cut all those back. I don't anymore. I leave them because, well, for two reasons. The first reason is that wildlife is gonna feed on those seeds. So birds will feed on those seed heads throughout the winter when food is hard to find. Second, if you look on the left and on the middle, if I do cut back, I leave about uh, 12 inches of stem, even on the smaller stems, as long as they're hollow or pithy stemmed. And here's why. About 30% of our native bees nest above ground. And some of those nest inside the stems of dead plants, if they're pithy or hollow. Even these little stems on the left-hand side of your screen, you might find those tiny bees and tiny wasps that are pollinators and keep your garden balanced nesting inside of them. So if I were to cut these back and compost them, I might be composting baby bees. That's the other reason I leave them up. And if I do cut them down, I leave those, st those stumps there. Second, I don't use mulch in my gardens. I haven't for years. In lieu of that, I use leaves that fall from the trees in my garden. We have oak, we have elm, and we have um, uh, sweet gum, American sweet gum. So I do this for a few reasons. Uh, first, it's cheaper. <laughs> Second, I got the leaves anyway. <laughs> Third, some moth species and maybe some butterfly, they will pupate on the leaves of deciduous trees. And as those leaves fall, the pupa might still be on the leaf. So if I were to shred them and use them as mulch or bag them up and um, compost them, I might be throwing out those pupa. Additionally, wildlife, amphibians, reptiles, birds, insects are gonna overwinter under that loof, loose leaf litter in ways that they couldn't do um, under uh, synthesized mulch. And then finally, about 70% of our native bees actually nest in tunnels in the ground. They do not nest above ground. 
and a lot of our native wasps too. So a looser layer of leaf matter as my mulch over winter allows them to get in and out. Like when they hatch in the spring, they can still get out. A um, Couple of things to be wary of. Don't just use any old leaves from any neighbor's yard unless you know that they don't use herbicides and pesticides. You don't want to bring those into your garden beds. Second, if the leaves of the tree are allelopathic, meaning they contain chemicals that have it, uh, they've evolved to suppress the growth of other plants like black walnut, eucalyptus, maybe pecan, I don't want those in my garden bed. And by the way, magnolia leaves fall into that category. And in the early spring, as these insects come out of diapause, in other words, their form of hibernation, I want to make sure that I have something for them to eat. So because many of my garden plants in the beds are not blooming then, I let things like crow poison and my wood sorrels, um, all of those little wildflowers go in my yard. And it's just conversations I have with my neighbors so that they understand why there are patches of little wildflowers that I'm not mowing that I mow around. Finally, last tip, stock the nursery. We often think in our gardens about the adult insects, but we don't often think about the babies and what they need to survive. So again, I said about 70% of our native bees and many of our native wasps nest in the ground. So in addition to avoiding synthetic mulches and just using leaf matter for my mulch, I also want to have at least one part of my garden with loose, dry, well-draining soil in a sunny spot where people are not for bees and wasps to use. This is a little furrow bee mama that I found coming in and out of her nesting hole. Isn't she the cutest? She's so small. And likewise, I want host plants for caterpillar and moth, um, uh, for the caterpillars of moths and butterflies. Instead of, um, you know, our wasps are really smart and they find where our caterpillars are. So I used to plant all my milkweed together and now I spread it out. I spread out my host plants in the garden so that if the predators find one batch, they won't necessarily find another. And that's a good way to balance. And that, my friends, is all. <laughs>